Tara, you're a tough act to follow. <laughs> that was a great talk. I mean, try and cry. You know, it's, it was beautiful. It was poignant. I couldn't make it to yesterday's event. It's actually in my clinic all day. And, um, and you know, it's cold and flu season. Black and black, she's bad and bola. And, uh, I swear, I had a person who said, you know, I came back from Africa and I went like this. And I thought, oh, come on. It's just, it's on our minds. So, uh, but I, I hear the cops with it. So, I'm honored to be here and um, actually thrilled to be your last speaker. It's, it's kind of easy. I think everything's been said. So, this is just going to be more fun than anything. And uh, I do have a bunch of moving parts, so I'm going to be behind the podium as opposed to where I normally like to be, just so we can kind of kind of keep track. So keep your fingers crossed. Um, so it's the color version. You have the black and white. I am. Um, I'm from Seattle. Grew up in Ontario, Canada. Came back here for college. Woohoo! I saw hand. <laughs> and um, one of my. Um, the people who I admire in my life, uh, my mother, who passed away a few years ago, was a lifelong artist. And we actually um, painted Easter eggs. And these are not paint, that's actually markers. And this is something that I share with my daughter. And, um, you know, she kind of like, you dip the egg and you put a little sticker on, you're done. It's like, not quite. You, you take like maybe four or five hours. And you really can't be an ADD kid and do Easter eggs with me. But um, the technique, the technique was really something we developed together. And you know, we hard boil it, you dye it, so they're all cute colors. But then we lay out all our markers, and these are the Easter egg markers, the special markers that would get all yucked up because you know, you know there were overlapping colors, the yellow had blue in it. And the, the technique we kind of actually discovered together was if you rub and rub and rub in one continuous spot. First of all, you're rubbing the dye off, and then that white of the egg would shine through. And we found that accidentally, you know, breaking a few eggs. But it was so beautiful, you almost had a stained glass effect, and, and it was just, you know, these look like these are relics. Of course, they are from the 1970s. So um, I still have these eggs, and they've traveled with me. There are quite a few of them. In fact, this is actually one egg. It's um, two-sided, so it's kind of, you know, bar relief on the other. And I think my hand was blue after doing it. Then I got a little more architectural and kind of, you know, geometric. And uh, there are too many eggs to show, but it's really fun. And I just want to make sure that anything you do in our lives, you kind of reflect back on what really inspired you to do things and be creative. So I ended up being a doctor, but it was kind of a circuitous path. So I, um, as Wendy said, I graduated from the School of Architecture and Urban Planning at UW. And, um, Really, people I said, what are you doing here? Because I had said I wanted to go into medicine. And I honestly think that's why I got to interview for med school, because they want to say, what are you doing? And I kind of, you know, back then, there was a little more, you know, not as much variety. I think, um, you know, coming from that, I was the first and maybe the, the only uh, person from that department to, to make it in. But, um, you know, so I had the right brain and left brain, and those things were kind of going on. So I'm a primary care physician at the Poly Clinic, which is a large multi-specialty physician-owned, last of its kind, uh, group in the area. I've been there about 18, 19 years, uh, internal medicine, and I have a couple of hats. And one of the more recent hats has been as the director of our Women for Change program. It's actually my program. We haven't expanded it to a big degree. And really, it's, um, it kind of speaks to a lot of things that you've all been teaching and learning about. Uh, and I wanted to give you a quick Prezi presentation, if this works, because it really kind of helps um, solidify where some of my examples are coming from. So, so um, that's me at the top. Uh, Menu for Change is a unique blend of science-based instruction with a whole foods focus in a personalized and holistic journey toward better health and weight management. Have you ever tried to make one sentence describe what you do? That's actually really hard. So um, Tracy Grant, who's my registered dietitian, certified dietitian on the left, what a cute shot. And uh, Kira Baum, who's an Catholic doc, and does anyone want know what EAMP means? Just sure. Asian medicine practitioner. A couple of years ago, Christine Gregoire, our previous governor, um, signed into law, uh, changing the title from licensed acupuncturist to, LA, uh, to EAMP, kind of to better expand the definition of what these people do and how they provide care. So it's really fun. What's it stand for again? 
East Asian medicine practitioner. Thanks. Um, and this program is really tailored into individuals. It's not a cookbook. You read this book, you're good. It's not Weight Watchers, none of that. And it starts with these what we call intake visits. We spend one hour, just one hour, uh, all three of us, individual three hours, uh, kind of meeting with people who are interested in better managing their weight. And I must say that people join the program to lose weight, but a couple have actually joined that don't need to lose weight. So it's not just about, you know, number of pounds. And there, uh, after there, we kind of sculpt the program. So people come in frequently or less frequently. We talk about them in person. We connect via MyChart, which is our electronic record uh, patient portal. And um, there's lots of kind of different ways we sculpt the program. And again, it's really tailored for them. Lots of tools we use. This is like a cute one, the plate method. You know, it's not about counting calories or counting this and counting that. There's uh, tons of resources. You know, this is actually a snippet from a bigger page about different fats and oils. A really cool resource. You know, what oils are best to be cooked at high temperatures and low and kind of a little more helpful for you. You know, fats good for you. Got to check the right one. So glycemic index, you're not about to read this, but you know, all these things are kind of, you know, things that we weave in and out of discussions. There's a monthly lecture series, Catherine Lester, we're gonna back, our videographer puts them on video, and it really helps to stimulate discussion. We've had many different presenters from all walks of life uh, literally come and talk. Grocery store tours, it's not touring the grocery store. We actually go there and say, hey, let's look for protein for breakfast, or let's look for good sources of um, you know, hydration. And um, lots of different kind of events that really kind of stimulate them to think differently than what their normal routine is. There's, this was a valley market. Um, it was really fun. Actually, Kira Baum told us to go find two vegetables you've never eaten before or cooked before. Come back and we'll talk about how we're going to do it. So that's really kind of cool. We have walking groups. I know all the paths in Discovery Park. It's amazing. Great place to walk. There's one of our little groups. Someone got their dog. And uh, support groups, um, and people come and go, and often I lead those. They're very intimate. Often just a couple people show up, and it's just, it's not like a big kind of competition. It's really personal. Group sessions with trainers. We now have um, uh, acupuncture in my office. Uh, we have uh, stress management workshops. It's kind of the list goes on. And, you know, we sculpt this, really, this experience for them to kind of match their needs. Some people are way too busy to see us each week. You know, they're working, and they're traveling. That's fine. We'll just kind of, you know, expand uh, how frequently we see them. Others are like, oh no, that's what's going to keep me accountable. Absolutely. We may have other resources, but we had a hypnotherapist. Kate Wells is up in Edmonds Come. She did a great talk. We had to come back. Did a group exercise. It was fascinating. Um, maybe career coaching might be involved. We had a wardrobe makeover event. That was so fun. But, you know, things that are just out of the, you know, off the beaten trail that aren't the typical medical shtick, which I think people really resonate with. We have a Pinterest website. Oh my goodness, it's fabulous. Uh, there's a potluck party. This is from the first year, actually. I'm going to zip through these. Um, the second year was just as fun, and I made them into a recipe for the company. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? This was done by a woman named Sheila, who I actually renamed Martha because she really is Martha, St Martha Stewart. She was channeling her. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, so you get the idea you can eat healthy. I think when people start uh, a program, they think about all the things they can't do. Oh, I have, to, I have to avoid this food group. And oh, I just ate lunch. I better blow off dinner because I lose my points. And you know, we just spin it around. I look forward to eating. I love eating. So I want people to really have that pleasure and that kind of treat as they're trying to improve their health, as they're trying to improve their wellness, and certainly lose weight. So, um, just some comments. What was the name of that program? Menu for Change. Thanks. I'll just sit through. Oh, failure. Isn't that just a ridiculous, terrible <laughs> word? Ugh. I mean, people feel there's always something in their lives. Maybe you go back to childhood and they couldn't ride a bike or what, but it's just, it's really a negative word. And just so many things pop up in your mind. But it's important for us as we kind of coach people to realize they're feeling a lot of these things. And it may be a portion of our minds, but they might feel like they've been defeated or they're, you know, they're a flap or they just, you know, everything is not working. And so that sense of failure is very poignant and very powerful. I think it's important to help people kind of redefine for themselves what they perceive as failure. And sometimes they do need some suggestions. 
uh, consider how to approach setbacks. You know, it's not the end of the world. They would feel that way. And look for ways to see things differently. I think that's the biggest challenge and the biggest, I think the, the most fun I have with people is giving them insight and allowing them and leading them to, to look at things differently. And it's so rewarding. My daughter took this picture. We were sitting at Starbucks in Fremont, right across the Fremont Bridge, waiting for Dusty Strings to open so we can restring my guitar that I bought at the Toronto House of Music in 1980. <laughs> and, and she took this picture and thinking, what a ridiculous thing. <laughs> you know, so there's lots of negative stuff around. So I mean, God, if I can't sit down and tie my shoe, I'm going to be arrested. <laughs> so, you know, failure, yeah, there are appropriate times in our lives. Hey, you're in school, you get F and all your classes. You know what? You're a loser. This is, that's just not appropriate. You know, you get fired from your job, you never show up for work. It's just, yeah, it's just really stupid. You know, you spend all of your money and your 401k, you don't have any time left. All your credit cards are maxed. You get the idea. I mean, that's, you know, to me, obviously, not to someone else, that's what I think of as total failure. But, you know, I think we have to keep that in mind as we engage people and look at their personal story. So, thinking about a clinical example from my program, the three-month visit is my absolute favorite visit. Three months is an extremely short period of time. I mean, it's like, when you think of all the years or decades they've been struggling, up and down, the way that they just can't lose, three months is so short. But boy, they want to lose all their weight in three months, don't they? It's just, ugh, those goals. So they come in and they see me, and I have, usually haven't seen them until the, since the beginning of the program. And um, they kind of, they're slumped, they're just their body language is not great, <sighs> they're sighing. And I only have lost five pounds. I'm thinking like, wow, that's great. Five pounds, you know, you've been gaining five pounds every few months for the last couple of years. Now you not just didn't lose weight, you actually lost weight. You're looking at like, yeah, okay. But, you know, we follow a lot of other parameters, and I get the pleasure of weighing them, measuring them, and doing blood work. Some of these, in three months, have normalized their LDL. Holy cow, they're bad cholesterol. Unbelievable. That's, to me, incredible. The A1C, the measure we look for diabetes control, that's already on the way down. Wow, that's really cool. You know, their blood pressure, sometimes, sometimes their blood pressure is better, not always, but sometimes that's an early, early mover. Their waist circumference, they can be down two inches. They're just kind of rearranging because maybe they're exercising. So that's really exciting. And they kind of know because their pants are falling off, but their sleep, their sleep often is better. You know, that's so key. And they don't see that as success, really, but wow. Their energy, that is the key. You know, they walk in, they're kind of perky, and I'm thinking, oh, they're doing really good. Uh, motivation, they just feel so excited. So after just 30 minutes, they're like sailing out of there in cloud nine. And here, when I walked in the room, they're like, oh, I'm just like a So it's, um, you can really empower people, and, and it's, it's a delight to have that experience. So this is from a uh, Journal of the American Medical Association article, actually not that long ago. Uh, quote, most patients seeking weight loss, surgery, sorry, I don't like that, but have high weight loss expectations and believe they need to lose substantial weight to derive any health benefit. Wow. Some patients expect a degree of weight loss they might never achieve. And again, this is, it may not be weight loss, and maybe other things are pushing someone on, but that's pretty profound, you know, to, to get that understood up front. Um, this was a chipmunk. It was the last living creature I was looking at as I stepped onto a helicopter on top of Grouse Mountain in Vancouver, thinking like, I hope you're not the last creature alive I've ever seen. <laughs> it was so exciting. It was out of my comfort zone. I had a great time. But be careful not to trivialize, you know, while redefining or helping someone redefine better. Because again, they may just feel devastated and living it. Not a big deal. So. Well, I, I think it's, a lot of this comes uh, knowing someone. So you couldn't really do that in a first visit and you're not really understanding where they're coming from, what their values are. I think over time, as you see them back again and you're kind of nudging them and, and nurturing them, then you kind of start to get a sense of, wow, they're really catastrophizing this or um, this, this is a big deal for them. It, it kind of seems really silly to me, but I need to come back to this because they're stuck and, and this, is, this is much bigger than I would project. So 
So again, not you know, I can trivialize it based on my personal experiences or values, but wow, it's it can be huge for them. So, so how do you approach setbacks? You know, it doesn't have to be all or none, of course. Um, it's okay to acknowledge, yeah, you slipped, you goofed up, or this is you know not going the right way, but then move on. I think you, you can't just dwell on the negatives. Um, reframe with respect to actual goals, you know, practical goals, reset the goals. Um, that's the whole smart goal kind of stuff. And I won't go through Prochaska stages of change. You probably have four presentations so far showing it, but uh, keep that in mind because it really is applicable. So here, I'll have to explain this picture. My darling daughter in the middle, number seven, reaching way up in the volleyballs at the very top of her fingertips. Um, of course, I'm a proud mother, and she really can't play volleyball, but she's on the team. And she looked fabulous. I'm like, wow, she's so beautiful. And the coach in the white, she's like, God, that was terrible. Because the girl behind her was waiting at the ball, and of course, she So the whole thing was bad. She lost the game, not because of that, but, you know, and then I'm like, but she looked so great. And it was, you know, I was so I just love that picture even the coach hates it. <laughs> so um, another clinical example, not from my program actually, but from my regular practice. Um, I, an elderly couple who is who are aging rapidly and the wife is uh, getting dementia and it's getting steadily worse, and the family is at their wit's end about personal hygiene and sending me secret notes and telling me ahead of time, you know. She really sticks. And we, we mentioned to her, and she just gets really angry. I go to the bathroom. I've been to the bathroom. And then she's not. And so I thought, ay, 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 ay. this is like, you know, this no-win situation. So I thought I'd spin it a little bit when she came in, and, and her son was with her. And, you know, I kind of asked her about how things were going, and we got into personal hygiene questions. Like, oh, she's fine. So not. And uh, so I pretended that I could smell urine, even though I didn't. I said, you know, you know, some of us kind of can't get there in time, or it's hard to wipe, she's very large, and she uses a walker, and, and I said, you know, I got into medical facts, I said, urine is one of the most toxic substances to the skin, and, you know, it's going to get wet, dark, moist, warm down there, oh my gosh, you're going to get bacterial infections, you're going to get you know, skin ulcer, it's going to break down, and I wasn't trying to give her some empty threats, but I was trying to say, you know, there's a reason we kind of want to be clean down there. And she just, light bulb, it was like, yeah, you're right. So I said, you know, why don't we? Because you're all, they're men at home, her husband and her son. She doesn't want them wiping her. So I said, why don't we arrange for a uh, morning aid? Oh, it was perfect. So, you know, kind of getting around that, this is going to go, she's never going to want to talk about it, to like, wow, this actually took a little uh, Another patient who's in my program, really have a hard time with her weight. Uh, kind of a very terrible loss. Her husband died from cancer. And um, she just was, was frank. She said, you know, I just can't eat alone. I'm just so used to eating with him and with friends. I just, I, I eat home. I just eat all the wrong crap. I don't know what to do. So, uh, unlike most weight management programs, I said, you need to go out to eat. You need to eat with friends. You need to go to social events. And that just really helped turn things around. So, Using the circumstances to kind of help shape a new solution can often be really valuable. I will not go through this, but I'm going to remind you of this just because of my next story, which is um, a man who was so proud that he quit smoking and really had done an incredible job. And then oh, he just got so sick, he had the worst migraine of his life, he was in the ER, and he started smoking again, and he just he came in kind of devastated. So, you know, he went back to preparation, actually launched right into action because I happened to tell him that, you know, there might be some really great value in doing acupuncture for your migraines, if you're stressed because of smoking. He literally almost kissed me. He was so excited. And now he's doing well. It was, it was just like that little bubble needed to move. Okay, we've all been there. Maybe not the word candy, maybe it's a coffee or sex, maybe it's um, X-Files, used to be an X-Files junkie, oh my god, I, I, was it Sunday night, I think, 9 p.m. Sunday night, it was terrible because uh, my call group would, you know, we'd all turn back over and so I'd be on duty Sunday at 9 p.m., and oh, all was, 
903, I get paged, like, no, X-Files is beginning. <laughs> so, you know, cool power, there's a lot there. Um, and many of you might know the White Bears experiment. So I'm telling you all right now, every single one of you do not think about White Bears. Okay, if you're thinking about White Bears. You know, don't think about chocolate. Oh, you know, it's just hard. Will power, there's so, there's so much, that could be whole talk in and of itself. Um, I actually don't follow, follow Kelly McGonigal, she's the, the person from Stanford. I'm actually not really into motivational speaking, but I kind of like some of her concepts. You know, she looks at I will and I won't and I want power. Um, you can look at her websites for all that shtick. But you know, a couple of her quotes really resonate. That people come up with resolutions that don't reflect what matters most to them, and that makes them almost guaranteed to fail. You know, I think you can be little or big. That, that's, that's why I don't like January 1st, you know, New Year's resolutions. I think that's ridiculous. We all pick a day and we're supposed to be perfect and figure it out for that. Will is the ability to make choices that are consistent with goals or values, even when it's difficult and part of you want something else. So these are kind of things that really resonate. So another story. I love this one. This lady finished one year of my Men for Change program. Lost zero. I'm talking zero pounds. So I walk in the room and I'm thinking like, She'll say, yeah, it's great. Oh, I love this program. I think like, wow. You know, she loves the support, and et cetera, et cetera. So another year passed, and we have, you know, the program doesn't just stop at one year. You can't, you, you kind of go into the maintenance phase, which can go on forever. And she never came in once during that second year. Didn't have any connection with me. So at the end of two full years, I saw her, and she lost 30 pounds. She's like, right. And I think like, please don't tell me about lap band surgery. <laughs> And she said, it was this program. I just, it's been in my brain all this time. I've been thinking about it. All these experiences I had with you were just, you know, were just there. And I kept coming back to them. And so two years later, she was doing fabulous. You know, so if you looked at her for the first year, you'd say, eh, you know, she loved that nice person, but did she cheat in weight loss? No, but boy, that was, that was to come. So I think it's good to really look long term. And that's where, unfortunately, we are kind of um, doomed by our uh, Hollywood industry, you know, it's boot camp, you're done after six weeks, you have a new bod. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And there's, there's great concepts of boot camp, but not to like redefine the rest of your life in that way. I hear a lot of chuckling, it's probably the personal trainers. <laughs> so, another story uh, a woman who um, is not in my program, but is a long term patient of mine, should be in my program. Uh, really, I was just just starting to help her make some really cool changes. She's getting confidence that she actually could start to eat a little better and move a little more, and she lost a couple pounds, and, and it's just, it was so exciting. Then she came in for a physical, did her labs, boom. Her A1C was 6.4, which is technically pre-diabetes, now it's 6.7. So nothing else has changed about her, except for that one little blood test. She was devastated, absolutely thought it was the end of the world. And I said, nothing's different. Nothing's changed. Yeah, we have to do a couple of checks and boxes, you know, for our you know, medical care and following you, but, but you can go right back to those things we started. Those are still valid. And she was just, she just lit up. She was so relieved. She thought she had totally, totally failed. So reframing that perspective is just so helpful. All right, you really thought it was the other word, right? So, you know, you just gotta look at things differently. And um, sometimes it's hard, you know. I looked at this sign, I was in, in Vancouver, BC, and they're like, what? Oh, okay, French Connection, UK, I think, but oh my god, that's kind of hilarious. But we get, we get stuck in certain ways of looking at things, and uh, we need to kind of step aside. So, um, I think coaching efforts should focus on helping to align expectations with reality, and that's kind of the basis behind goal setting. And another patient story, um, really, really, really tough uh, prospect, a guy who's well over 400 pounds and just can't do it. And he came in through his three, actually kind of skipped his three months, it's more like five months, but you know, months into the program, and his weight's going up, it was just really difficult for him. And I thought, you know, what can I do? I'm the bigger principal, and he, he, he liked examples. So I said, you know, you're not a speedboat. You don't just zip into the dock and make those quick turns. And I think I'm like, oh, what's the analogy? Oh, you're like one of those cruise liners. 
you know, like kind of nudges in, he has two tugboats guiding the dock. He goes, oh no, I'm an aircraft carrier. <laughs> I was like, you know, I love it. And he just, he totally, he just totally went with that idea that you just needed to really look at this from a whole different pace. And so we redefined kind of this time frame that, that was way too ridiculously set at the beginning in terms of what kind of goals he wanted to achieve. In fact, I think the only goal I did that day was, can you come in twice a month? It's the only goal. No other changes, just can you come in? And, you know, it made me really think about this kind of ponder, is a time frame even really necessary for some people? That may be the, the, the barrier. And so just to kind of, you know, there's not like by one year from now, we're going to do this. I mean, it, it, it can't be too open-ended, but we have to re really rethink and think about the time frames. So I actually think self-reflection of us, the coach, the caregiver, can, can have a place. Um, but it's not a competition. It's not a you know, comparison. It's more just kind of demonstrating that we're human too, you know. We have issues that we deal with, or challenges that we have, or that we're facing, that maybe we're not so good at yet, or we want to get better at yet. Um, people, some people who know me know that I have rheumatoid arthritis. I've had it for 14 years, I'm counting. And it's it's almost like a party trick when someone's talking to me about their, oh, I can't walk anymore, my feet hurt, and my knees hurt, and I say, I totally understand that. And they look at me like, yeah, you don't. And I just kind of, if I know the person, I share some of my story, they're like, Wow, I didn't know that. I said, you know, you just can't tell when you look at people what they're feeling inside. So I, you know, it's easier then to kind of say, you know, there are activities that are really supportive of your joints. I know a great personal trainer is going to be really caring and kind and gentle and help you get to your exercise goals without pounding the pavement and doing things that are harmful. So they just, it's just, they feel so happy you share that with them. Or hydration. You know, I'm always really trying to encourage people to get more fluids. It's empty water, but water's good. And I love to put myself up as a negative example because I'm not perfect either. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'll be just chowing down my second cup of coffee and I said, you know, I just had two cups of coffee and a sip of water, so I'm, I'm actually technically dehydrated right now. So uh, I think there was a study a number of years back that said, looked across the country, maybe about a third of us, all of us, are running around just a little dehydrated every single day. That affects a lot of things, math skills, mental, memory, energy, and you know, all those things we go, oh, wow. So, you know, glass of wine is not hydration, a glass of coffee is not hydration. So you can't, you can't have those, but remember, get that fluid. So sharing that, again, is a little, little personal story, that just, yeah, that's right, that's right. If you walk around with that water bottle all day long, or you're not drinking it, that's not staying hydrated. <laughs> ah, success. Isn't this more... A nicer word. You know, look at that exclamation mark at the end. It just makes you feel good. You know, everyone looks back in their history, and maybe it starts in childhood. You know, your first tooth, your first, you know, poop on the toilet, your first walk without holy mommy. I mean, there's so many things that are really cool and successful. But there's lots of little events too, and I think it's really important to celebrate those, to to acknowledge those before they zip on by and you forget about them. Oh, Dr. Seuss. And will you succeed? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. I love that. Childhood one. So acknowledge the victories. Um, some people actually can't acknowledge them themselves. Help them acknowledge, celebrate it. Put them into proper perspective. That's key, though. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's not saving the world necessarily if they decide to have one more glass of water that day. Um, and really, you know, see them not as an end unto themselves. I think that's key too. You can get caught. Yeah, I did this. Now I can go eat pizza. No. <laughs> so here's the first of my video clips. All right. So Bridger is a six-year-old black Labrador retriever. <laughs> We're just going to get a chance to ride and get all set up there. There's actually two methods of pulling the boy into the pool from the dog. We have what's called the chase method. We also have what's called the place to stay. So Ryan's going to be doing what we call the place and set. He's going to set the dog to five, six, eight. He's going to give the man that dog to go. That's an unbelievable first go. That was pretty cool. That dog was such a pro. The next dog, you can kind of so excited. 
This dog, not so much. In fact, this would be a great video. The owner almost went overboard with the water. The dog would screech and oop, and she'd run. And, and it was just, it was really funny. And I think she, later I just said, you've been doing this for years. You just didn't do it. So, yeah, and it was so great. That's really pretty cool. Another video, I'll have to just preface. Does anyone know Rube Goldberg? Uh, oh, yeah. So, he's been on for many years. So in middle school, when I was in high school now, their, their eighth grade science project, they had to pair up and do a rude go rude and video it. So I won't narrate this, but we can laugh afterwards. It's really kind of cute. So we're going to push this envelope through this um, hatch, and it's going to hit this um, marble down the funnel to hit this marble to hit the the car, which is going to go all the way down this incline plane, which is then going to hit our lever, which is going to like lightly touch the ball in order for it to roll and to create a domino effect, and then it's going to uh, knock that down, which is going to release our remote onto the scissors that will be snapped shut at the end, and that um, bucket will fall into the bowl.
Part two. And his wife, Elaine, Elaine Mullane was there. She was about 80 going on 60, prancing across the stage like a gazelle. Oh my God. It was, it was really uplifting, I must say. Another patient story. Uh, someone who is in my program and in just three months lost 90 pounds. Waist circumference, this man, down by five inches. Holy cow. And I measured it twice. And this was, this blew my mind. His A1C starting program was 12.7. That's like this close to I'm going to be in the hospital soon. In three months, 5.7. We did the lab twice because I thought it was an error. Yeah. Unbelievable. I was, I was just literally tongue-tied. I didn't know what to say. It was incredible. And he was going through tons of personal, aren't we all, lots of personal stress and stuff. It was just profound. That is something to celebrate. Oh my gosh. Another woman lost 18 pounds in three months, waist down by two inches, already reducing three of her medicines. I bet you next, you know, a few, three, six months, we'll get her off of her medicines. And uh, she also was really starting to take charge about her personal approach to all that work stress, and we all work stress, and kind of put things in perspective. It was really, really nice to see. Uh, these are just incredible things to celebrate in just three months. So this, these are snippets from our wardrobe makeover, and on the right side, the gal on the left of the slide, Hannah was our uh, lady who does this, and I actually met her in the bar department of Nordstrom, but she doesn't work there anymore. She has a private business, and we put these three ladies on the left, um, and we went into their homes, and we spent hours in their closets, going through every item of clothing. And we end up in these big piles, that's one pile on the right, it's actually only half, I think when it, we finished it probably would have covered their faces. But, uh, and then she'd go shopping and try to realistically, you know, fit them close because some of them have, you know, uh, lost some weight. And then the, the slide on the left is, uh, we have them come and walk down the aisle and sachet, and it was really so fun. <laughs> that was celebrating. Oh my goodness. That was really celebrating. Can you buy the size and shape? <sighs> Put things in perspective. Do you know, I cried when I found this out. This is only one week ago that my daughter got 500, had 500 reading component of our Washington State MSP test. And at first I thought, oh my god, this is incredible. I'm not going to put it in perspective, you know. And she already had, maybe that's kids for you, because she's, yeah, this is great. Okay, what are we doing tomorrow? And, and oh, I, you know, I thought, wow, to be proud of this is great, but to, to not let that be the be all the end all. So she and three other friends I've taken on a little overnight trip in the summer, kind of a pre-high school party. Uh, over the Bainbridge Islands, kind of night farm, great story along those lines, but in Winslow, which is the town right next to the ferry dock uh, in, on Bainbridge, there was a uh, couple of trees that were decorated with kind of uh, what I want for me in the next year. I think it was put on by Virginia Mason, actually. And so all four girls stopped and they filled out their little, you know, wishes and put them on the tree. And so, of course, I had to take pictures, and this was my daughter's, to do well in high school and lead an amazing and inspiring life. Isn't that what every parent loves to see? Oh my gosh. So that beats the hell out of 500 out of 500. That was just, that was just incredible to me. So I think as we look at navigating our own labyrinth, or walking the labyrinth, and kind of pausing and thinking about things that we've failed, forget that word, but that our clients may feel like they're failed at, and stopping and savoring and celebrating ways that we have had success and you know you reach that center and it really is a good feeling to kind of put those things in perspective so that was my super fast talk and i'm willing to take any questions and go from there Yeah. 
Thanks, and I'll rephrase the question. So she was asking me about, you know, in the beginning of my talk, there was a, um, someone who went through the whole first year, didn't lose any weight in the second year, and, you know, she felt so good, though, but from a weight perspective, she hadn't lost any weight. And the other example later on was a man who just in three months had lost 19 pounds and fabulous, you know, parameters. And I think to me, and you asked, do we kind of delve into the psychology and kind of how do we approach I guess yes, I mean I'm not a psychologist, but I think that's probably a very big component of, of how we relate to people in, in this program. Um, trying to find out where they're coming from, what's meaningful to them, meeting them there and helping them change is, is a very intricate dance and it's not something that happens quickly and some people it takes a long time. Uh, but redefining what fear is, redefining what success is. And I would say that first example is very humbling to me because I I don't know why. I had already had this preconceived idea where I was already judging, thinking like, yeah, she hasn't lost any weight, she's not going to like, oh, I was so wrong. That was the learning experience for me, to realize that she had profound support and really appreciated it. And then to see two years later, she was reaping the benefits from sowing those seeds, you know, agriculture and energy. It was just, that to me was like, wow, I've learned. I've learned that. And I think what's also really nice is I can also share that story without the details with others in my program who may feel stuck or just demotivated or just like, oh, this isn't working. So, you know, we have to look at the different perspective. And I think that's such a valuable lesson. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So much, you know, it's interesting because I showed you the well-being will this morning and I was talking about how well-being is self-defined. I think it's a really important message to keep in perspective that so is success. Success is self-defined. Failure is self-defined. But it is important to look at perspective. We've heard that a lot about changing perspective, having a different perspective on things. You know, it's about helping people have that different perspective. And I think the other thing that's really important is thinking about you, you, all, you may never know the difference that you're making. You may never know because, as Dr. Brown Doyle said, you know, she went a couple of years without seeing that particular person, having no idea of the influence that, that the program had on her. So... You may never know, but you are making a profound difference. You have the opportunity to make a really profound difference. I thought it was also interesting, the discussion about is time frame even necessary? Because yesterday, Susan Schmidt was talking about there's no finish line in human development. So in that context, no time frame. There is no time frame because there's no finish line in human development. And I think that's important for all of us to keep in perspective. And, you know, you also mentioned can't tell what people are feeling on the inside. That's kind of that first picture that I showed yesterday when we were talking about the framing, that, you know, what people say and do isn't always what they think and feel on the inside, and it's so important to get at what, what they think and feel on the inside, to get at their heart, their soul, their spirit.